Well, thanks so much for the invite and for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I appreciate your reference to print media. Um, often when I was based in the US, it wasn't just old media. Sarah Palin spoke of lamestream media that we represent. So it's good to talk to people um, to whom probably print media seems as uh, uh, innovative as a carriage or a Nokia cell phone or so. Um, I would like to talk about um, a concept that is um, close to my heart, the European public sphere. She was mentioning it. I was based uh, for a long time in Washington, D.C. before and recently transferred to Brussels. And um, while I was really looking forward to getting away from the frenzy of uh, covering yet another Tea Party nut fest, mm -hmm. I was um, a little concerned that I might be getting into a, a snore fest at the European election level. But it didn't really materialize. I think we all agree that they uh, wrapped up their game in this election. That was probably the most widely covered uh, European election ever in uh, European history, both in the traditional media, the online media, uh, and of course in, in, in the social uh, networks. And that is, that is real progress uh, that we've seen there. Um, obviously, with comparison to the US, we have had the strong impact of the Obama uh, campaigns. While the Obama presidency, I see, think overall is seen as a rather flawed concept, everyone can agree that they were really cutting edge in the use of social media in those elections in 08 in, uh, and in 2012. And you know much more about this than me, but you, uh, we all agree that uh, that is the most effective way to reach voters, to get people to tune in. If, uh, if somebody posts online that he or she has voted, if they recommend to other people that they have voted, urge them to vote, that was incredibly effective uh, in their campaigns, and that's actually how they won the elections. Um, I wouldn't go that far to say that this is change we can believe in in Europe and that we've seen a digital revolution and that's hence my rather pessimist title of uh, saying that the uh, revolution will not be live streamed in Europe. Um, that uh, I think we still have a long way to go for a number of reasons that I would like to point out. Um, obviously, we have a different level of quality. I mean, we've had Spitzenkandidaten, which is a beautiful German word, that was picked up all over the continent um, on, uh, uh, during this election campaign. We've had a German Spitzenkandidat, even Martin Schulz for the Social Democrats, which really uh, um, urged more Germans to vote and also increased the media coverage, certainly in Germany. But if you just look, I've brought a few visuals to be really cutting edge, even if I'm from an old media outlet. So we have this picture. How many of you know that picture? How many of you have retweeted that picture? Oh, and only one. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm impressed with your 40,000 followers. Well, that's pretty impressive. Right? So you, you have part in it in a way, too, because that is the most, before the Oscars of, last, of this year, actually, when... As you might remember, the winners all took that selfie and then tweeted it, and that was the most tweeted selfie of all times. You've had that picture that was released literally the minute after it was clear that Obama had been reelected. You see the couple there, and it was instantly, well, within a few hours, the most retweeted photo ever on, uh, on Twitter. So very smart use, obviously, of, um, of social media. Now compare that, I mean, I know it's a little unfair, but this is the election... Uh, the photo on election night of the incoming Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. <laughs> it is an impressive picture too, but it's not really something that embodies change and something we can believe in. Uh, this is another picture of him shortly afterwards, of him trying to high-five his British prim uh, Prime Minister David Cameron. <coughs> so you, you, I think you have a different level of candidates. Um, which is unfair to uh, touch them because obviously the Americans have had a lot of headway in that regard and they have been trading that. And Obama was a much weaker candidate when he started than he was uh, in 2012. But you, you, you certainly had a certain awkwardness in uh, the European elections. And uh, just to give a brief summary in the beginning, I think overall it's fair to say that the European elections have, A, and that was mentioned in the position paper too, still two national uh, or covered too much from a national angle, they had rather weak candidates, and they didn't have an, a super effective use uh, of social media, our big topic today. But to give them some credit, I think the increase has been rather impressive. Uh, the, the European Parliament, for example, released an uh, election 
a video that was clicked on more than 11 million times. This EP hashtag that you might know was used more than 1 million times in the run up to the European elections. Uh, this Facebook, or here, I hope this is the right one. No, I don't see. Well, uh, there was on Facebook, there was an I voted application, and on Google, you suddenly saw a European symbol on the, on the search page, which you might have seen. So that was a, a, revenue, a reminder for people to vote, and it reached uh, roughly around 100 million uh, people. It didn't do much, though, it's fair to say, uh, to increase turnout, but at least you saw a con a, a more of an effort uh, to get involved. There was even a, an online contest called Taste of Europe, which told us that Bulgarian Shopska salad is the most uh, uh, popular dish in, in, in Europe. So there was some uh, involvement and some development of a European public sphere. However, there were real drawbacks to it. I don't know how many of you uh, realize that the Greens were holding an online primary to select their Spitzenkandidat, and it was an abysmal failure. They only had about 10,000 people tuning in, while there are almost 200,000 people in uh, Green parties all over Europe. So it was a very low turnout. And I would say that traditional media still largely, and, and traditional and national media, still largely drove this campaign and influenced this campaign, not the social networks. Which brings us, of course, to our responsibility at Spiegel, uh, which, as some of you might know, is a weekly magazine on print, uh, in print. And, uh, but of course with a very active uh, website, very successful website, which can be updated basically minute by minute. So we had to face that question, what are we going to do in the magazine, what are we going to cover in the magazine, what are we going to do online? I think magazine-wise, um, it's a fair assessment to say that we covered it much, much more than previous elections, and there was much more of a European public sphere. Uh, in general, not just in our magazine, but in, 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 in the national media, in the German media, but also in other countries. But we didn't cover it enough. I mean, if I compare it, for example, to the previous elections, where I remember we were sent to every primary debate in, uh, in Iowa, or Republicans, or uh, my parents, when they picked me up and when I flew home for Christmas, they would ask me about superdelegates in Florida, and if Hillary is going to win these superdelegates and not Obama. So people were incredibly tuned in. You didn't see that to the same extent, of course, in, in, um, in, in this coverage. It was harder to push editors back home to really get focused on it and to really pay interest, because as was pointed out in the position paper, it's much harder to associate faces with, with Europe, symbols, to really get people uh, to tune in. So that, what we did in the magazine, we had a few long stories, for example, how does the European Commission really work, which is still a puzzle to many people, I mean, including myself. It's a 30,000 people institution, but it's really hard to figure out what these civil servants do, what their powers are, how qualified they are, so we did a long piece on that. We did a long piece on the European Parliament, which is probably even more puzzling to people, which is actually a very powerful instrument by now, but only, largely only understood by lobbyists who uh, really lobby them very hard because they know that the systems there matter immensely, but national voters and national media are, are usually not very interested. And then after the election, as you might remember, there was this whole struggle if John Paul Juncker now, after he got most of the votes, should become, as promised, the European Commission president, and some people, including our chancellor, had reservations about it, and we did long stories on that, on the backroom deals and process, so that was interesting. But then we thought, well, we have to do more online, we have to get people more involved, being cutting edge again, we have to um, get people involved that are on Twitter, that do Facebook stuff, maybe YouTube videos that um, uh, uh, people post, and I have to say, overall, I'm, I was a little disappointed uh, with um, the material we could work with. I mean, obviously, we tried to do uh, best of tweets, maybe interesting interactions on Twitter between EU opponents and others, or maybe post the five most hilarious Facebook uh, YouTube videos of people that support the European Union. And I, we, we didn't, really didn't find very much. Um, there was. I want to show you one video that actually made the cut and that was rather successful on YouTube. It's in German, so not all of you. Sie haben uns ausdrücken lassen, diese Schweine. So, Sie haben uns alles genommen, was wir hatten. Basically, the video is... Sondern auch von unseren Vätern. Und von unseren Vätern. Und von unseren Vätern, Vätern, Vätern. Und von unseren Vätern, 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 Vätern. Ich glaube, da brauchen wir es nicht. 
the funnest. And right. So basically, they keep repeating the question, well, what has the European Union done for us lately? And then people shyly say, well, there was ACTA, uh, there was uh, the abolition of, of uh, roaming charges, there was other good stuff like preserving peace, uh, doing uh, protecting the rights of minorities. So that was done by the European Union. But they keep saying, oh yeah, but what else have they done? And that video, as you can see in the collection, was did rather well and was picked up by many media. We have featured it on the site. But there wasn't really much of it. I didn't see um, a very effective use either of, for example, Twitter by the candidates. Um, John claude Juncker was largely absent. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure he hasn't tweeted before he started the campaign. Um, when Cameron opposed him, so he rather sent out a few hilarious uh, uh, tweets uh, when the Germans won against Brazil 7-1. He, kept, uh, he tweeted then instantly, well, that was the biggest defeat uh, since uh, Cameron tried to stop me, and that was picked up by many. So some people, I mean, ironically, they used it, but uh, overall there wasn't really much interaction compared to more professional campaigns uh, that we discussed earlier. What we did then finally on the website on election night was a, was a Tumblr. Um, so it was a minute-by-minute minute update involving a large number of, of editors and correspondents um, all, all over Europe, and that did, did, that did remarkably well. We were actually surprised that very many people tuned in, and there was similar stuff going on in the European Parliament, and that was also picked up by, by uh, many media. So I think that was a, a success, and it showed that people tuned in and were particularly interested in behind-the-scenes stuff in Brussels, because as you know, Brussels and the Brussels bubble is still a, a puzzle uh, to many people. But why is it so much more difficult? Why is it so hard to really get people to tune in, to get uh, voters, editors, people like you more interested in, in the Europe stuff? I mean, I, I think we already discussed the quality of the Spitzenkandidaten. Okay, that's fair. Then we what, what we, what we don't have in European elections, and that might be a plus, but I would rather see it as a minus, it's that lack of a shitstorm, basically. What you have in, in, uh, in American elections on a regular basis, people focus on one embarrassing moment, on one big mistake you made, on something you say that is really stupid, which of course leads to basically two robots running against each other because everybody is afraid to make a mistake that is then widely covered. But if you look back at the last presidential campaign, for example, I don't know how many of you remember that remark made, a Romney, Mitt Romney, the uh, Obama um, challenger, made uh, about female participation in the next government. He was saying, well, I have a binder full of women here that I could ask. And of course that didn't go over well in the uh, uh, um, online community and it was picked up everywhere, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, people were uh, doing parodies of it and it took on a life of its own. And it really hurt him tremendously. And Obama has made similar experiences in the past when he uh, was saying, when he was filmed interacting with a voter for example, and he was saying, well, we're just going to spread the wells around. And that really hurt him because people used that, I mean, from the other party, used that to online, in social media, to uh, paint him basically as a socialist or even worse, a communist, which as you know is not a good thing in American politics. So. Uh, that was picked up, but that didn't. That never really happened in um, in in um, in this election. I mean, we tried to do it a little bit because I was one of those people in the newsroom pushing for um, real thorough coverage. I mean, my point was, and point of others too, was that if you have Spitzenkandidaten, then they are fair game, and we can cover everything. And we really have to investigate the past. We have to investigate what they have been doing. And we did a piece in the magazine on the drinking habits of uh, John claude Juncker, which are illustrated here. Uh, he's the guy in the middle with the large glass. Um, but the story wasn't really picked up anywhere. Uh, other media actually chastised us for it. It's uh, indecent, unprofessional. Or so. so people are reluctant to really go that far. We have had similar experiences, for example, with the coverage of Martin Schulz, who at that time, as you may know, was the president of the European Parliament while he was running for this new office. So there were a few stories we did, and other media did, on this dual role, which was a little controversial, but it, it never really 
gain traction. It never came to the point that people really had to justify themselves publicly. For example, on the drinking story, you could just say, well, I don't have a drinking problem, and that was it. So it went over, which, which would be unheard of in a, in a different, and also in a more intense social media environment. It was largely not picked up there. What I would say is one of the problems, and that was hinted at in the position paper, is really the lack of symbols in, in Europe. I mean, if you have, and I'm just using that example because we talked about US politics a lot, if you look at the White House, everybody knows that's where the power is, that's where the president is, that's where everybody wants to be. And that is, it is, it has a certain sexiness about it, which is really illustrated in, in American politics. There's a very successful American website that you might have heard of called Politico, which really has shaken up the American uh, media coverage and the political coverage, which was founded in Washington, and it really strives on that aspect that while they do very serious policy coverage, they also focus on politics, of course, a lot. And, it, and people are really interested who uh, could be a contender in the next horse race, who is right now the hottest commodity on capital, who is not that hot anymore. In Little they have rankings of the hottest politician, that has, which is unheard of in, in European politics. Many people don't even have a face that they can connect. Usually the, the communication in, in Brussels is largely run by civil servants. The people speaking for the European Commission are usually civil servants, and hence they are usually very careful, very balanced, very boring, unfortunately. So you don't have that, that sexiness factor, as I would put it. If you, if you want to compare that with, with an illustration from a text driven textbook about the institutions of the European Union, I think you get the idea. That's how they featured it. Uh, it is incredibly complicated, incredibly hard to understand. And even now, with, for example, Juncker being elected commission president, I think if you did a survey among people how much power he really has and what his position really is, people wouldn't fully understand. So that, that is one problem. Then obviously, we have the problem of languages that um, you also pointed out. We have 24 official languages in Brussels, which also means, for example, the European Parliament has 24 Twitter accounts yeah, in all these languages. Or the, the hashtag that they use for the European elections also changes from country to country. So that makes it increasingly hard to really have in European public sphere. And if you ever make it to a European summit, and I would advise against it because it's exceedingly boring, but if you ever make it there, after a European summit, there is not one press conference of all the leaders, but there are 24, no, what is it, 28, 28 different uh, press conferences in 28 different rooms. Uh, so Merkel has one, Cameron has one, Hollande has one. Um, and they all frame the message, of course, in their national way. They speak to their national journalists. And that, that is one of the problems uh, we are facing. We also don't have a really European press corps in the way, for example, the, the White House press corps um, operate. That also leads to the lack of a really leading media outlet on the continent. I mean, in Brussels, if you ask people, for example, and I hate to admit it, but uh, they wouldn't refer to us, for example, because we are in a way limited by us publishing in German. They would probably point to the Financial Times, which is published in English, which is uh, read by most of the, of the Eurocrats. But of course, it has a very special focus on uh, the EU, being British, being largely interested in financial matters, regulation. But you don't really have an outlet that is that is um, read uh, across um, across the continent. You've uh, had some efforts, television-wise, at Euronews or others, but they are largely overshadowed still by the national um, uh, national outlets. And uh, we we actually have an English website, Spiegel Online International, which is great and which uh, helps us a lot. Um, but uh, we also don't have, or we decided not to invest too many resources there because it's just not really paying off. And that's a problem given the current media crisis. I don't really see the emergence of one new outlet that really um, really dominates um, dominates that debate. And, and then, of course, you also have a very national, a very national, oops, very national uh, campaigns. I mean, if you, I want to show you two pictures of the way the German campaigns were run. So you had this billboard of Martin Schulz, and that, that, that he ran, uh, I think, one day before election day, and it says, 
Only if you vote for Martin Schulz as the Social Democrats in Germany, a German can become president of the Euro European Commission, which was an astounding statement in a way at the end of an European election campaign. I mean, it's, of course, he appealed to voters that take pride in electing a German to, the head, to be head of the European Commission, but it is not the end of a European campaign. Uh, equally, you had it on, on the conservative side, where you had this poster, which is particularly ironic because it says in German, together we're going to be successful in Europe. But who is missing? Jean-Claude Juncker, of course. <laughs> because the, the Spitzenkandidat of her party, actually, of the Conservatives in Europe, was invisible in, in, in Germany. There were no billboards with Juncker because, as you might know, Chancellor Merkel is basically the Obama from 2008 in Germany. She's immensely popular still. So his party, her party, decided to to uh, run billboards only about her and um, and her party, and, and not even to mention Juncker. He also wasn't mentioned um, mentioned in the debates. Um, so finally, to pick up also on your uh, position paper, because you mentioned that you need this two-way communication, that you need to get more personal. So what I think is still missing. Uh, in what also probably many of you do, um, I think actually there are too many Europhiles tweeting. I, I rarely see tweets um, that are really controversial or that represent the other point of view. I mean, there are many, many people, and I think that's a very encouraging sign. People like you, uh, basically, uh, I know it's a tired cliche, but the Erasmus generation of people that have grown up with Europe and take it for granted and are really, really pro-European, which is a great thing. And they are very active in these networks. You have many, many uh, new startups, be, be it in Berlin or here, I'm sure, or in other countries, that, that really try to build that European public sphere more. But I find them a little boring, to be honest, because they are all so pro-European <laughs> that there isn't really any argument around. So what we were looking for was also a more diverse, um, uh, um, more diverse opinions uh, in, in the social media sphere, and that I haven't seen in this campaign. I think I looked looked rather uh, carefully. And then I think the other problem, what you also hinted at in the position paper, is that problem of selectivists, as you all know. I mean, we are probably all selectivists. It's much easier to to click on a on a petition or on. Uh, I'm going to show you one petition that. Uh, is rather successful, at least in Germany. The Kempak uh, opponent, uh, the Kempak resistance to TTIP, to the transatlantic uh, um, trade agreement, um, which can be very influential. I, I mean, the, I spoke with the Commissioner of Trade, and he told me, "Oh, we totally underestimated the power of social networks. We handled that very badly." But they only overlooked it because they are so bad at communicating in, in, in Brussels. It was very obvious to everyone that that would take off at some point and that it would influence people. But of course, 300 or 400 or 500,000 people clicking on that petition doesn't really change the policy yet. Um, you mentioned that we covered the NSA and WikiLeaks stuff rather extensively. I think that, to me, that was a similar development. You had a lot of outrage in the social media. You had many petitions urging Merkel and others to do something to protect our data, but it didn't really translate in, let's say, demonstrations let's say, people are quitting their Facebook or Twitter accounts, punishing uh, the American providers. So I think that selectivism is online a real problem. Uh, and, and politicians know that, of course. And to come back to the American uh, uh, example, I think that is the next level that is still missing here. Because people say, well, Obama won two campaigns through social media. That's not true. He won through a combination of traditional campaigning and social media. So let's say you start on Facebook, you start on Twitter, but then people from the campaign go knock on every door and urge people to vote or tell them what, are, what um, why Obama is a great president and others. And that level still is still missing. Obviously, there are differences. I mean, for example, we're particularly after the NSA scandal, we are not going to use big data to the extent Americans use them or are willing to use them. So. Europeans probably don't want that next level, uh, for, or don't want to fully embrace that next level. But that is important to remember, that if you really want to initiate political change, also in Brussels, there has to be an additional step. I mean, people also have to gather, they have to organize, they have to come together, and it's not just 
uh, clicking on a on a on a petition or um, uh, on that. Uh, sometimes things were also handled very unprofessionalized, I think, which is which is normal. I want to show you one, and, and if there are any Germans in the audience, I would be interested if they have seen that. Hallo, da sind wir mal wieder. Jan und Gar aus Straßburg. Does anyone know that? Mm -hmm. No. Yes. Well, these are two of the actually rather skilled and, and promising members of the European Parliament from the Greens. She was actually the Spitzenkandidat of the Greens. He's a, a, a very active, um, he's very active on data protection. So they are, of course, great. But now they're trying to talk about their first week in Parliament. Der neuen Legislatur. Genau, diese Woche haben wir sozusagen das ganze Parlament neu konstituiert und ein Präsidium gewählt. Juhu! Und, uh, hey, Terry, was hast du denn hier? Ich bin der gewählte Abgeordnete. Ach, geil! Ja. Sauber! So you, you get the idea. Basically, they are claiming to be surprised that this person is also a member of Parliament now. And they say, geil und sauber, that's great, fantastic. And so, so they were mocked mercilessly and I think they at least that woman <laughs> damaged her reputation considerably uh, through that video. So there are fallbacks, obviously, and drawbacks of, of, um, of, of being active in, in social media. But to summarize, um, I would say it is the beginning. I, I don't want to be as pessimistic as I may sound uh, in the title of my keynote. Um, if you look at the democratic development, I think there has been a real one. No one will be able to reverse that idea of Spitzenkandidaten. And now that uh, it became clear that the, uh, even a candidate with such flaws as Jean-Claude Juncker became the commission president, I think we're going to see much, much better candidates in five years, and they will be much, ha they will have much better campaigners, and they will be probably be also more, more uh, focused on, on social media. So I think uh, in a way, we have made progress. We are not there yet, but we are on a uh, on a good way. And with that, I would like to hand it to you.